Our scripture reading today is Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. For I am about to create new heavens. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Be, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am, I, I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth. And one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall build and another inhabit. And they shall not plant and eat an, a, another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long journey to the enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear, bear children for calamity. For they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox but the serpent is food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. You sure? Now, wasn't that nice? Isaiah was really waxing poetic at that point in his ministry. Uh, so keep that in mind, how nice that vision was, okay? That dream that Isaiah had. And he was speaking for the Lord. And remember what was happening at that time. Jerusalem was under siege. But God's going to save it, okay? That's, you keep that in mind, because wait till you hear this. Oh, boy, I'll tell you. Now we've got to read from the Gospel of Luke. In the 21st chapter, beginning at the 5th verse. Now, uh, this part of Luke is really busy. I mean, almost every few, uh, say, five verses are another story of Jesus and Jesus' ministries and teachings and things like this. This happens just after Jesus has seen the widow at the temple give just two little coins and how all these rich people are there, you know, boasting about how much they just gave at the temple and how, and he remarked how much more she gave than they did. Remember, remember that story. Well, this comes after that story. Now, they're at the temple. Where is the temple? Jerusalem, Jerusalem which Isaiah just said, I'm going to make it new, okay? Here we go. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked Jesus, Teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he and the time is near. Do not follow after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then Jesus said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of me. 
This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and the wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Here ends the reading of scripture. May God grant its meaning to our hearts and our minds. I was able to have looked ahead at the lectionary uh, a week or so ago, a couple weeks ago, and believe it or not, this whole service was put together before last Tuesday. <laughs> Honest, it was. And so, you know, last Tuesday happened. I, I, I woke up Wednesday morning, found out what the result was, and I realized that it wouldn't have mattered what the result was on Wednesday. This was still a really good set of scriptures for today. And I still like the sermon. So you're going to get it anyway, okay? Seriously, I'm not kidding. First of all, when you hear that Isaiah thing, I got a problem with it, especially the lion can't eat hay. Did you know that the cats in the whole cat family, they're the only animals that are pure carnivores? They are. That's the way they were made. Uh, the hair doesn't count. They don't eat that. They just want. Seriously. No, seriously. All cats are carnivores. The, all they eat is meat. And they don't care much where it comes from either. A lot of it has come from right here on my hand. Um, Seriously, so come on, the, the, the lion's not going to eat hay. It would be nice if the lamb and the lion could kind of live together. Then the lion would, of course, die of starvation. But, see, that's a dream, isn't it? It's a dream told to persons who think their world is coming apart. And it is, by the way. I mean, the, the, Jerusalem is under siege. It's going to fall. The temple will be torn down, that great temple of Solomon, with all those stones and you know, precious jewels and everything. All of it is going to happen, as Jesus pointed out. You know. But still, Isaiah the prophet says, but the word of God is different. But the dream that God asks you to hold on to is different. Here is what it is. And in it, there's unity of people, and people don't just raise food for themselves, remember, but for others too. Did you get that out of the, the thing for Isaiah? You don't raise your children into a time of horrible things, and they're just going to die and things like that, like if you were in Aleppo right now. Uh, so the, that dream says, but God's dream that you are to try to live forward with is different than what you see around you. Then we switch over <laughs> to good old Luke. Oh boy, that was, that was a real downer, wasn't it? After, after you hear all those great words that, that Char read from Isaiah, then you hear what Jesus says to the people at the temple there in Jerusalem. It, was, it wasn't real happy, was it? Or was it? Or was it? He's saying the same thing that Isaiah said to a people who are surrounded by calamity. The Romans, of course, are in charge of everything. The Romans, every once in a while, decide to remind the Jews who's in charge, and they kill a few of them. And now the Jews are trying to kill these Christians because they're undermining the very Jewish nation they believed in everything. So everybody's trying to get all the followers of Jesus. They're starting to anyway. He warns them it's only going to get worse. He's right, wasn't he? And then, and then he says the thing about there's going to be, what, what's he say will be some of the signs and portents, but even that isn't the end of everything? What are some of the signs and portents you heard him talk about? Earthquakes, 
New Zealand, it just happened yesterday. And there's going to be famines in places and, you know, all that kind of, and wars, remember wars and, and all these things. You see, you can say that about any time in history. Do you understand that? that now, Jerusalem isn't always going to be under siege, maybe, although it, in effect it still is today. Uh, but that's the way the world seems at any given time in history, especially in our world. We have television, we have radio, and we have, yeah, the internet and two, two words, social media. Very good, yes, yes, social media. Like everything is around us all the time. And not a lot, a lot of it isn't very happy, is it? A lot of it is kind of scary. Okay. Now, when I, when, when I read back over these two things again a couple of days ago, I was thinking, you know what? That thing from Isaiah, every two years here in America, we hear that story. Did you know that? Think about it. Every two years, why am I saying that? Yeah, elections. <laughs> well, especially state level and national level elections, isn't that the kind of stuff that politicians say? And I don't care which politician it is, I really don't. They're gonna make things the way we dream of. Everything's gonna be better, huh? That's every two years, and even in the off, quote, off year means not presidential elections, we're going to hear it two years from now again. And the truth is that no matter what a politician promises at that level, it isn't going to happen. Or if it does, it's going to be so, you know, wishy-washy or imperfect just because of the nature of human beings that it's not going to be what we heard. So first of all, let me suggest that what Jesus is trying to tell the people is that, yeah, you're going to hear about wars and rumors of wars and drought and famine and, and nations are going to be fighting each other and babies are going to be born to calamity and all this stuff. You're going to hear all this stuff. It's all going to be true. But that's not the end of the story. In essence, Jesus was saying, they're going to come and they're going to tell you all this stuff. But maybe your ultimate trust shouldn't be in them. Okay? In fact, when you think about the dream that we heard of in Isaiah, of a world truly at peace, not just absence of war, but where per persons are living together in a kind of harmony where people grow things and share it with others and take care of each other, things like that. That kind of a world, that, that, that kind of a dream is over and against the kind of reality that we see. Not only that, it's over and against the reality that comes from the persons that promise the dream. Did you ever think of that? That everything that we tell as, uh, as our Judeo-Christian stories, every time we present our dream to the world, the one that we're supposed to keep alive through our kids and our grandchildren, Isaiah talked about that, remember? The kids and their generations. Well, every time we present that, it clashes with reality. So, what is the role of the Christian community at all times and in all places vis-a-vis -vis every government that exists? Hmm? There was a man that dared ask that question. Oh, gosh, it must have been 70 or 80 years ago now. Uh, his name was... H. Richard Niebuhr. He was the brother of Reinhold Niebuhr, if you ever heard of Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, he was a theologian. Uh, uh, he also taught the history of religion and things like that. 
But H. Richard suggested that there are all kinds of, of uh, pictures you can paint of Jesus from the New Testament and even some from the prophets of the Old Testament. And he gave about 10 different ones, but he said the one that is always correct is Jesus over and against authority. Jesus over and against power. Jesus over and against the governments of the world. And he went on to explain, well, of course. It's not like Jesus is a revolutionary, but Jesus refused to speak anything but truth to power. And so he told the power how bad they were, but then also Jesus held up what? For everyone to practice. Love. Now that's kind of crazy. <laughs> when you think about it. That's, that's a pretty high bar, isn't it? If you ever hear a politician out there saying, when I get in office, everybody's going to love everybody else, don't vote for that politician. I mean, that's the biggest lie in the world, isn't it? However, that's what Jesus said no matter what. It got him killed. And it's what his followers have been saying and trying to practice ever since, and it has gotten many of them killed. May get a few of us killed someday, who knows? But can you imagine what it would be like in this world, especially in our America, where we speak of so many highfalutin values that we believe our forefathers had? So many, so many uh, ways that our nation is better than other nations or our form of government is better. We have all those things we want to say that are good. When the truth is spoken to us, it's never going to sound very nice, is it? But what if that dream that we hear in Isaiah, what if the idea that everyone is able to practice love with everyone else, even somebody who doesn't like us, what if that dream disappears from the discussions? Think about that. What if nobody holds up the impossible dream? What if we just think of it as Don Quixote in that great musical that I hope they bring back to Broadway? Really? What if the dream never gets held up to reality? What if there's not a group of faithful people out there trying to live the way of Christ and then speaking the truth to power that things should be so much better? You are forgetting the disinherited. You are forgetting persons. You are letting money decide things for you rather than, you know, whatever truth needs to be told, Who's going to do that other than a group that has this impossible dream that's been given to us to keep it alive through our lives, our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives? What would the world be like if that dream disappeared? <clears throat> See, it didn't matter who won the election last Tuesday. It really did not. Our job doesn't change a bit. We have got to hold up that dream. We've got to try to live out that dream in our own ways, in our own missions. But Jesus said that through our endurance, and I think it's going to take a lot of endurance, to continue trying to establish peace with justice, to continue trying to explain that you can love persons you don't even like and show how that's done, to continue to spend money that sometimes we don't know where it's going to come from to feed others who want, might not have that meal without it, to tutor little kids who don't have some place to go at home or some one to go to at home, to get the tutoring they need. You know, what if, if that's not going on, what's the use of holding up the dream? But if we don't hold up the dream, if we don't speak the truth to power, if we don't endure even 
when it's hard. What did Jesus say we will lose? What do you get through endurance, according to Jesus? You gain your soul. That's what we lose if the dream doesn't endure. So let's always remember that. That as, as rabid as we want to get or as, want, as far as we want to run from any election that's ever held in our wonderful country where we're allowed to have elections, really, and vote and things like that, hey, 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 don't get so upset about that. You got something a lot more important to worry about, uh, something that's a lot more work than that election was. It's that dream that Isaiah spoke of. And it's that endurance that Jesus calls us to to be the ones that speak the truth to power and always hold up love over hate. Now, our last song today was written in the 1800s by a brilliant uh, brother team. One wrote the text and one wrote the lyrics, I mean the music, but they were both African Americans. They were living in the time of the Civil War and Jim Crow and, and all that. Long, not long after it had been written and started being played and published around the United States, it, ha it had become and still is thought of as the national anthem of African Americans. But we're going to sing that. We're going to sing it like it was meant to be sung as a royal song. And it's hard not to cry because... See, that song talks of enduring and keeping the dream alive. 